So uh, let, let us start our, our last uh, institute seminar of this semester, which will be delivered by Todd Valint, uh, a researcher who needs no introduction, yet I will give a very short uh, introduction to, before his lecture. So uh, Valint received his PhD in 1988 under the supervision of Saz Domokos. He joined the Rainey Institute early on and also served as professor at the Technical University, where a stronghold of Hungarian probability theory was built in a joint effort of Professor Saz and him. Uh, currently, he is also professor of probability at the University of Bristol. Professor Toth was an invited speaker at the ICM in Rio de Janeiro in 2018 and at the European Congress in Barcelona in 2000. He served as editor-in-chief in top journals of his field, including the Electronic Journal of Probability, Annals of Applied Probability, and currently he's one of the editors of chiefs at probability theory and related fields. So I give the mic to you, please. So let me thank again. So thank you for this, this opportunity to speak about, about these topics. You see the title on the, on the board. And uh, as you all know, Giorgio Parisi was one of the recipients of, of this year's Nobel for, Phys for Physics. And that's, that is, the, that is the, the occasion why uh, I, I, I present this talk about his, okay, the impact of his work on mathematics. So I will speak about some physics and what the mathematical consequences of, of this physics is. So first of all, who is this, who is this person we speak about? It's uh, Giorgio Parisi. He's an absolutely well-known name in, 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 in the physics community. And he's best known in, known in mathematics or mathematical related community, probably for his work in the last two, so statistical physics and disordered systems, spin glasses, neural networks, and so on. But mind that before he started his career, before he started to work in these fields in the late 70s, he already got them big name in, in elementary particle physics, high energy physics, string theory, and so on. So it's not the case that he just jumped into statistical physics from start and continued from there. So he, has a, he started as a very young person and he had really great results in, and great, the great achievements in these fields. And here is just a selection of the most uh, distinguished accolades or, or best distinction he received. And I, my principle of selection was the following. I only selected those medals and uh, distinctions where I could find at least one more Nobel Prize glory uh, 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 beside, beside, beside Giorgio Parisi. So these are only those. If you want all of them, then you have to go to Wikipedia and see a list of at least three times as long. And if you have, you want to read really more details about his person and his personal how should I put his character and so on, then please do read Imre Kondor's recent paper in Physical Assembly, in the last issue of Physical Assembly, for many reasons. So that's a short paper of about four or five pages, and surprising connections appear there, which I'm not, which I'm not uh, exposing here, but I very much encourage you to do so. To read it. Good. So that much about the person. And here is the plan of my talk. As I understand, I have about 60 minutes to speak, right? So here is the plan of my talk with some time sketches, and, but certainly I was not able to, to for, forecast the minutes, but I sort of tried. So I want to give you a sort of large picture of, uh, of some of three topics. I selected three topics of the many from his work. By the way, he published something in around of 1,000 papers or so, and, and in many different areas. So it's, it's, it's not easy to select. The first two is, is sort of straightforward in the selection, the spin glasses and replica symmetry breaking, because that's probably the, the work for him for which he's best known. There's no question about this. The second one is also more or less straightforward choice because these topics of domain growth and boundary motion and what you see there, KPZ, which means Kardar Parisi Zang, that's the, the three authors of a paper which initiated this direction, is an absolutely hot topic in, in, in uh, not only in probability and partial differential equations today. So there are dozens of papers published 
they say every month and some very important ones. So it's no question that this is these the first two are the topics I have to speak about in this in this for this audience. And I selected a third one for some other reason, which you will be maybe if I arrive there, that that will be that will be uh, evident why. And uh, that's again related to the second one, by the way. Uh, and the TSAW means true self-avoiding motion, self-avoiding random walk. It's about random walks with long memory, where long memory arises in a very natural way from some local interactions. And uh, okay, so these are the three topics I want to touch: spin glasses and replica symmetry breaking. I'm not sure everyone in this audience knows much about the easy model or the lens easy model. So let me just start from the very beginning and slowly to let you understand why, why these are major issues, why these are very important issues. And I, follow, I apologize for those, to those of you who really know what, what it is. So what we want to understand, so the easing model is the simplest mathematically straightforward formulate, straightforward is formulated model of statistical physics. In statistical physics, we want to understand the behavior of huge large systems by large i mean in the limit when the size goes to infinity uh, of elementary small units which interact between them and this interaction induces some sort of distribution so it's about probabilities it's a very natural thing and goes back to to gibbs and 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 uh, boltzmann actually to boltzmann and gibbs in this historic order the following formulation, I, I tell you, this is the simplest model. No, it's not the case that statistical physics is this. This is the, the most simplified, but already non-trivial case. Imagine you have a finite set. This finite set will go to infinity. The size will go to infinity in a meaningful way. I will let you know what I mean by meaningful way. So lambda is a finite set. Its size will increase. So I speak about the sequence, actually. By omega lambda, I mean, the fun, so assign plus or minus one to each element, to each point in lambda. That means partition in two subsets lambda. So all possible partitions, the set of partitions in two possible colors is my state space. So when I identify the state of my system, I tell you which, which point in lambda, what sign has plus or minus, right? And I define a function which is called in physics jargon the, the, the Hamiltonian, so energy function, which assigns a real number to each single configuration. And the real number is such as you see here. I have some j sub i j symmetric, j sub i j equals j sub j i, a symmetric, say, matrix of interactions, each pair. For each pair, a real number is, is assigned, which tells me what kind and how strong an interaction is in between the two spins. So let me tell you, the, 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 so use the language of, of physicists. So these sigmas, which take values plus or minus one, I call it spins. And the energy is consists in this very simple formulation of what? And to each single, for each single pair, the interaction interaction constant that might have a sign of course times sigma the product of the two sigma so this can take on two values plus if the two agree plus minus if the two disagree and add another term which another parameter h enters it's just a real number times the sum of all sigmas and if you want think about the sigmas as little magnets that's how physicists say and think of the j sub i j's for simplicity as ones for some pairs. And that tells me that if these spins are parallel, then the energy is small because I have a minus sign in front. And if these two are opposite, then the energy is high. Right? And given this energy function, I define a probability measure, and that's my central object. The probability measure in the last line, which I called mu, mu sub lambda, is the probability measure. There is a, yet another parameter entering here, namely, take the weights, define the weight of each single configuration being proportional. Let me double, go down here. The weight, that means the probability measure of each single configuration is proportional to negative this beta is a positive constant, but I have a negative sign in front, minus beta times the energy. If the energy is high, then there is little probability. If the energy is low, then it's higher, higher probability, right? 
And Z is just for at this moment and on this slide, Z appears just as a normalizing factor to make it a probability measure. It will have much more important role than just a normalizing factor, I tell you. And as I told you, what we want to understand, this measure, the behavior of this measure, and of course, expectations, probabilistic objects, variances, and so on, under this probability measure for interesting variables, which make physical sense, right? Okay, and let me give you some examples. And a basic example, and that's how it arose, that's how Lenz formulated, Wilhelm Lenz formulated the problem first and gave it to his PhD student and it's easy to solve it. It turned out to be a terribly difficult problem for a PhD student. Namely, take, take the d-dimensional integer lattice, think about it as a graph, take a finite box, say a, a, a cubic box in the, uh, lambda is a finite cubic box in, in, on, this, on this graph, make the interactions being between neighboring sides be one and zero other ones, right? One and zero otherwise. That means that indeed neighboring spins are likely to stand or are expected to be parallel and not anti parallel. If it's anti parallel, you pay. So that's the energy function. Now, this is, and go back to the previous slide, define the probability measure, try to understand what happens. And the big question I will I tell you from now is, is the question of phase transition, whether for beta is the parameter I'll let you. Beta, so I tell you, beta is inverse temperature. High value of beta means very low temperature. And, uh, and what one wants to understand whether these local, very harmless looking local interactions have some sort of global effect that in the end, the, the whole measure shows some strange and interesting behavior in the limit when the size goes to infinity. And by interesting behavior, I expect, for example, that far away spins are correlated, remain correlated in the limit. No matter how far they are, imagine the limit meaningfully, uh, there remains far, uh, far away correlations. It's surprising, why? Because the interactions are only local. So local interactions induce long-term uh, correlations. And I tell you from now that actually it will be a behavior depending on dimension, and depending on the value of this beta, so there will be some critical beta for values of beta less than that you don't see long-term long -term correlations, it's like independent random variables. For beta beyond some critical value, there are long-term correlations. So that's the easing model, and that's the ferromagnetic as I formulated it. And I say here, this is really well understood by now, but it's not the case that it's trivial. So it gave work for very serious mathematicians or mathematical physicists, including starting with Lars Onsager, everyone knows who Lars Onsager was and people like that, to that today we arrived at a stage where we understand I'm not going to speak about this much because my time is short. And in the 70s, in the mid 70s, came up the problem of, for, was formulated as far as I know, uh, the problem of so-called spin glasses. So when the interaction is very orderly, so everywhere is the same. Then there is some very interesting behavior which you understand well, and now the question comes, okay, make the interactions random. Make the interactions random. Let the, this space interact with some random strengths, which is given at each edge of your graph by independent identically distributed standard Gaussians. And it makes physical sense. So it's not just a, a, a toy for mathematicians. It does make physical sense. That's why it got this name, spin glasses for disordered. So this is a, a prototype of disordered systems. And, and as you see, the people who, who first wrote a paper about that, it's, it's Sam Edwards who is, he didn't get a Nobel, but he could have gotten a Nobel. He's one of the big physicists of the 20th century. And Phil Anderson, who, who was the, one of the most interesting figures in solid state physics during the second half of, during the, from the 50s to the 80s, until the 70s, at least. So these are big people. And they formulated this problem. And it was clear that this is enormously difficult. So all the methods you could apply for the orderly space cannot be applied here, don't work. And let me just tell you that this problem, so the problem is the same. Define this measure I spoke about, but now imagine that this J, you are on the lattice, on this integer lattice. Define, imagine this J, I, J are not 
ones, but are plus or minus ones, or they are, say, independent Gaussians. And it's enormously difficult, no method supplied. It's an absolutely open question whether there is long range order, there is a phase transition, there is interesting behavior. Okay, interesting certainly is because it's difficult, but there is some dramatic change in behavior when, 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 when the size goes to infinity. Okay, so if it, this is too difficult, if this is too difficult, then make it simpler. Make it simpler and define the same thing on a complete graph. Actually, if I go back in history to the easing model, should be four easy and 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 lens the me the, the complete graph problem was treated by okay it's called the curie weiss model it's not trivial but but uh, doable and what what these these two gentlemen sherrington and kirkpatrick uh proposed is let's let's do on the complete graph sorry let's do the same thing on the complete graph take the complete graph of size n define your hamiltonian as you have seen it before but now with j sub i j interaction between any two pairs, so you don't have geometry that makes it much simpler. You don't have finite dimensional geometry. You have a gombo, if I did, how to say. So without geometry, uh, and and you have to divide by divide by a square root of n in order to make sense. Otherwise, things interaction becomes too strong because everyone interacts with everyone. So the interaction be Gaussian with variance one over n, zero mean Gaussians with variance one over n, and do the same. It looks much, much simpler because you don't have to care about, about geometric issues. And it turns out to be enormously difficult. And why is it enormously difficult? I will tell you in a moment, but I think here I, I give you an example to have a feeling what the problem is about. What the problem is about. Imagine you have a big collection of people. 100 people in your, you have to manage as a director, as a director, you have to manage 1000 people, right? And between these 1000 people, there are strong, strong or not so strong positive or negative sentiments. Each pair either love each other or hate each other, not equally strong. So for a pair, the, the quality and strengths of their sentiments between, by the way, the sentiments are, are symmetric. So there is no hopeless love or something. Right? So the sentiments are, are encoded in these J sub IJ. So J sub IJ positive means that they are they sympathize with each other. J sub IJ negative it means that they don't like each other that much. So that's given. And your job as director is to separate them in two groups. You have two big offices. And you want to separate them in two groups, in two offices, in such a way to cause the least frustration. And frustration is measured by the sum, or satisfaction is opposite of frustration, is measured by the sum of these, of the J sub i J's of people in the same room, right? If they are in the same room, then, then you have J sub i J, the sigma positive or sigma negative are the two, right? So this is an optimization. And it's a very, very, very difficult optimization, stochastic optimization. It turns out to be a terribly difficult. It's easy to speak about it. It's a terribly difficult stochastic optimization. Now, if you want to really find the best, that means finding the ground state, the state with minimal energy in my formulation. If you relax this and you want just to, prob to, to get a probability measure which is close to that, but not, then you take this Gibbs measure I, I told you, right? I will come back to this slide in a moment just to explain what is the difference between, between the ferromagnet and the spin glass is the energy lens. So imagine the energy function as a function of that sigma. This is a misleading picture, of course, because this sigma takes values from the n-dimensional hypertube, and I drew it as a one-dimensional line, so it's misleading. But nevertheless, it tells you something, that while in the ferromagnetic case, you have two well-identified minima and you, ident you easily say which the two minima are. And if you want to find the ground state, you put either all guys here or all guys there. And if you want to relax the temperature, you know what to do. In the spin glass case, the landscape looks somehow like this. And finding the minimum or close to minimum, or which are those states which are close to minimum energy is enormous. Even relaxing, in the sense that to put in a temperature and take this e to the minus beta uh, times energy is terribly difficult. Okay, so that's the that's the difficulty. And why? Is, okay, I think 
whenever you speak about the mathematical question, these are the two questions or a mathematical problem, these are the two questions you have to ask first. Why care about it? Is it relevant? Or, and the second one, why is it difficult? I think I told you why it is difficult. And I gave you an example, which maybe doesn't convince you that this is a paradigm of a very, very rich variety of stochastic optimization problems. And beside that, there are the physical populations. So this, it, it makes sense. Right? Okay, so this is the lens. And once you learned a little bit of statistical physics, you know that it's no good that it's hidden, that, 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 that corner is hidden. Can we do something to move a little bit up? Maybe I can. Uh -huh. Right. Now, the first object of interest, this was already by, by Gibbs in, in, the, in the late 19th century identified, is the so-called free energy. Remember what this Z was? The Z was the sum, ah, yes, I tell you here what the Z was. This, that was the normalizing factor in the probability measure, but actually what it is, is the sum of, of these Boltzmann weights or Gibbs Boltzmann weights, e to the minus beta times energy, right? So take this sum, take the logarithm of this sum, divide by the size of the system, and let the size of the system go to infinity. Do it in this order, of course, otherwise it's meaningless. Right, so take ex exponentials of the energies, add, after, uh, uh, add for all possible states, logarithm one over n. And I get here to the next line for the mathematician, you can think about this one over n log zn as a moment or cumulant generating function. In probability, this type of things appear, and these are cumulant generating functions or moment, logarithmic moment generating function, and everything is encoded there. So you can compute things from that. That's why they are important. So it's not just a normalizing factor, but it's, it also has probabilistic meaning. And here is an equality with some question marks and with an exclamation mark because, because somehow the physical intuition at the very early stage, it told to these physicists that actually this will be, should be equal to the average, to the expected value of that. Mind that these are random objects. There are the Js, the Gaussians, which are there, which are there in the Z. So this is a random variable. As long as n is finite, not infinite yet, before the limit, this is a random variable. But there is some sort of hand waving and convincing argument saying that, that this self averages. That means, like in the strong law of large or in the law of large numbers, weak law of large numbers, so that the value is equal to in the limit to the, to the expected. Okay, you see this slide. So, first of all, I told you this, this remark already. Second remark, this B, this. What is called the Gibbs free energy is only one of the objects of interest. It's so called thermodynamic function, but it encodes a knot. It encodes, for example, the phase transition. It encodes, so whether this function, the analytic behavior of this function, mind after the limit, the analytic behavior of this function contains a lot of information. So that's why it's important, right? And, uh, and uh, one more remark here in the middle that this question, whether there is self-averaging or not, turned out to be a moderately hard, not trivial, but not the most hard, uh, concentration of measure. Mind, concentration of measure as a topic in mathematics came after this in the 80s, mid 80s. Okay, so that's the thing we are interested. And in this first paper of Sherrington and Kirkpatrick in 1975 already, they make a, they make a proposal how to compute, how to compute this, 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 this free energy. What they propose is the following. Okay, this is a much longer, sorry, I, I should hide my. This is a longer, the first two lines of a longer sequence of identities. I'll just so show you that you see, write the energy. This is just exactly what was on the first two slides, that these J sub i j's are independent identically distributed Gaussians now. The one over square root of n is there. The sum over all, oh, okay. I run, I run a bit ahead. Take r equals one. Take r equals one, then you have one single thing here. That will be just the free energy. Now what, what, what these guys propose is that rather than compute expected value of the logarithm, the logarithm is a difficult. You have a very complicated expression, take the logarithm very difficult. 
rather than compute the logarithm, the expected value of the logarithm, compute the expected value of the powers. Let's see what we get. So for any R, which is into, which is positive, non-negative into, positive integer, compute the R's power. Uh, the, the arts moment. Ah, I don't know what happens. Compute. I don't push the good button. No, I push the good button. Compute the arts moment. How do you compute the arts moment? You write down note J is the same. Here J is the same with the same realization of the randomness of the of the interactions. Take two copies of your physical system. Take the product of the two sets, write it down. You get this expression when r equals two, or take three when r equals three. Compute the moment. When you compute this expectation, this external expectation with respect to this Gaussian, you get some Gaussian integrations, and you get a formula like that. And let me not go on because I don't want to bore you with computations. Anyway, it's a long, longer line of computations. So this is the first step. Now, the second step is the following. This formula I got here cries for a kind of Laplace method of, of variation because you have a capital N up there. You can order one order one element, say, mind, these are sigmas are plus or minus ones. You add n of them divided by n. This is a Hamming distance of two points on the on the on the cube, right? On the on the n-dimensional cube. You have this n here, so it's clear that a variational problem. So write down a variational problem, a variational expression for this for any R. Now, this is very difficult. There will be some simplification here on the next page. And here comes a step which is famous, so or infamous, actually. So everyone knows about this, 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 this mistake these guys make, namely to make it for all R integer and extend it continuously to Rs, which are positive real. And at R, as R goes to zero, then try to get something about the logarithm. You will see one. Now, of course, you see this sign, what that means, that, that be careful, be careful. But anyway, so it's not a bad idea for a start. And now start computing, start computing. This is what you want to get. As N goes to infinity, take the logarithm of Zn, Divide by n, take the expectation of the logarithm, divide by n, let n go to infinity. Write the logarithm as that limit, no problem. There is no, no cheating, no problem. Interchange, now as you are mathematicians, you learned in the first class of analysis, never interchange integrals with limits because if before checking Lebesgue's dominated convergence. Now the physicists learn that, but they say, let's try and see what we get. So there is a bit of danger here, but you have to be careful. Next, what do you do next? I have to, yes. Next, you just say that this guy goes to one as R goes to zero, formally. As R goes to zero, this are something. So this limit is the same as logarithm. This is, a, uh, this, what is that? It's a Taylor expansion of the logarithm, something like that. So that's easy, that, that there is no problem here. There is again some problem here that, that you interchange two limits. You interchange two limits, right? Now, again, if you are a physicist, you are a bit braver and you may do it and see what happens. But it's not the case that, that people do stupid things. It's, you have to feel when, 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 when you can't do that, right? And the last step is the, the one that on the previous page that now let replace this uh, something is the same step as this one. So you get the logarithm as limit of MR over R or MR minus one over R or something. So this is paid for. So there are three points which are very dangerous. Otherwise it's stable. And the last step, so this is just the proposal of Sherrington Kirkpatrick, right? If you get a final result, write it as a variational thing. So this is a plan, this is a plan. And what I do in the first, okay, what I do is the following. Let's go back to the first. Let's go back to the first step. I did this first, first step of computations only to show you that this quantities arise. Mind the replicas means that, that on the same randomness of the J's, I take R copies of the system. So the, there is a common randomness there. Otherwise they are independent, right? 
And this object appears naturally from computations, which tells you what? In the replica A, A and B are two different numbers between one and the other, the two, two copies. You have the spins in A, you have the spins in B. You add these two and divide by N. This will be exactly what? Exactly in your language will be the Hamming distance of the two points on the, on the, unit, on the, on the N dimensional unit. Right? So this is, a cent this is a central object. It's already clear from here that this is a very central object. This must, be, must play a very important role. And it does. Okay, so that's what we learned. And what, but what, what, what this Sherrington and Perpati propose in their second step is the following, that indeed a very complex and difficult uh, variational problem arises there, which they cannot solve. No way to solve. It's very difficult. And they make the following assumption. If I take on the same randomness of the environment, I define independent Gibbs copies. These are, these are uh, invariant under any, any permutation. Aren't they? And as these numbers Q appear, yes. these numbers which are for overlaps appear there in the limit, of course, you don't care much about order, so limit and so on. In the limit, these numbers must be the same because due to the, due to the, to the permutation invariance. They said, okay, let's do the variational problem formulate with the ansatz that these numbers are the same for all pairs of copies. And they get a non-trivial optimization problem and they get a result to that. And that's the proposed solution of the spin last by Sherrington and Perkins. Now, these people came not later, after, not much after. It's very weird. They are made in Taules, and mine Taules got a Nobel Prize in physics not long time ago, not for this work, but uh, certainly it's not mine. So. And they realized that, <coughs> that Shelton and per per Patrick's answer is correct up to some critical value of beta, which happens to be, I think, one, if you normalize that. So it's, the critical value is computable. And wrong beyond that. And in the sense that the result is thermodynamically, what it gives, it gives negative entropy or something. So some instability appears there. So it cannot be good. It cannot be good. It's not because Sherrington and Perpatrick were just beginners, but it's a difficult problem, and they didn't that the good. So that's, that, that, so it was, it, it's, it's no good. You have to invent something. And that is the point when Paris is stepped into the story. And this is it, here it becomes even more interesting. When Paris got into the story, uh, so I, I, I give you a logical reconstruction of three papers of Paris here, because, because if you read the original papers, I'm not sure you will. Okay, it's not easy to understand, right? Now, what he says is the following. These overlaps, let me tell you again what I do because better we understand well than not. Take the same random interactions, define 100 independent copies, R equals 100, say, independent copies of the physical system but with the same interactions. And you get this QMAB, which is the Hamming distance between the spins in copy A and copy B. Right now, think about these as being random variables on a huge probability space, which I'm going to to to, to, to identify. Now. The space is first of all r to the n choose two for the interactions. We have r the n choose two interactions. These are real numbers. R to the n choose two, and you have r times the Hamming cube for the spins. Right. So the total big probability space, the space itself is what you see there. And the probability measure, you define it, is first of all the Gaussian measure on this, which just in plain words, the J's, the N choose two J's, N choose two J's are independent, identically distributed Gaussians, standard Gaussians divided by square root of average. Right? And conditionally on J's, you have R independent Gibbs measures on the, on, on the R copies. Is it clear what the problem is? It's a bit complicated, but not very difficult, right? And okay, here is the big idea. And you may say with looking back after 40 some years that it, oh, it's not a big idea, it's an absolutely great idea. That actually it's not their values 
which are which are uh, which are uh, permutation invariant. But there is a joint distribution which is permutation invariant. The joint distribution is permutation invariant. And if that is the case, let's see what we get. We expect, so okay, he didn't formulate it in this way, but this is the meaning of what he writes, that in the limit when n goes to infinity, these random variables jointly, say r is fixed 100, it could be 1000. So these overlaps, which are random variables jointly, they converge in the sense of weak convergence of probability distributions to some limiting distribution. Right? Not the numbers converge, but their distributions. And if their distributions converge, a big surprise here, and I think that caused difficulty for the physicists at the time. I can't, this is my reconstruction. I'm not sure it's the case. That in, that in the limit, the J's themselves, you don't see the J's themselves, but their fluctuations is there. It's, there is no self average. It's not the case that for that the statement is like this, that for almost all realizations of J, something happened. No, the, the limiting could the cover the distributions in the limit, they will fluctuate with J, right? This makes it a little bit difficult to understand. And if this converges, then the limiting distribution must also have some very, very special, stru uh, special structural properties. One of these is called ultramatricity, and that's the main one, ultramatricity. Note that these Q's are actually distances. One minus Q's are distances. The Q's are overlaps. One minus Q's are Hamming distances. So it's a metric. So the limiting distribution will be a, metric, a distribution on, 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 some, on, on some metrics. And ultrametricity means a metric space is ultrametric if any all triangles are isosceles with longer, okay, what's the English name for that whole? So longer legs than bases, right? This is very special. There are there are there are metric spaces like that. But so this is what they call ultra metricity. And there is something else which I call the Girlanda Guerra relations. I will speak about that later. So not only that this limit should exist, but the limiting distribution must have some very interesting structure, right? And what Parisi says that the variational problem back in the second step of Sherrington Kirkpatrick should be a variational problem for this limiting distribution and not for the value. And that's what where Parisi's famous formula comes up. There is another subtlety here, which I didn't write on my slides, that actually only the one-dimensional margin of this very complicated this joint distribution at enters, but it's not the case that you can compute the one-dimensional marginal bit without computing all, right? So it's a, it's a very, very subtle. And here I to this formula, I didn't write down the formula and I, I, of course I understand the formula, I wouldn't be able now to write on the blackboard either because it's too long and it's not so informative to tell you now, but there is an explicit variational formula for a distribution and that is solved and that's Parisi's formula and nobody believed for tens of years that that's true because there are so many, so many tricks and so many unbelievable things there that people didn't believe. Now, okay, in the physics literature, there were some checking, maybe the same type of stability, which did not hold, which failed in the Sherrington Kirkpatrick was checked by Kostarvitz and Taulas. De Almeida and Taulas were the authors of one paper I mentioned already. Now Kostarvitz also entered into the story and these two guys, plus a third one who is not playing in this, in this story, got the Nobel for 2016 for other reasons. And let me also mention here that, that Imre Kondor with, with uh, surrounded Dominicis, oh, Dominicis also, also, so these two papers checked in a, this is what we call thermodynamic stability, which indeed calls for this solution. So it turns out to be at least not contradictory, although mathematically not established. And, and now let me let me let me give you a sort of selection of my favorite mathematical results in this story, which is certainly a very subjective selection. The main things are there, but probably if someone else gave this lecture, then other things would be would be would be listed here. So the first very important paper is this one by Francisco Guerra and Irlanda, I don't recall his first name, where they, they 
they uh, established this, what I call Guerlanda Guerra identities, which is a very funny thing. I'm not sure I'm able to tell you in, I tell you. So this overlap, this limiting distribution of the overlap is a distribution on arbitrarily many uh, overlaps. So this type of distances, right? And the Guerlanda Guerra relation tells you that if I give you if I give you the joint distribution, if I give you the realization of any simplex, of any complete collections of any, if I give you, these are pairs, right? If I give you all pairs up to three and you want to add one more, then this one more you want to add is either conditionally on the values I gave you already, is either one of these values exactly uniformly chosen between them or totally independent of them similarly distributed. It's a very beautiful thing, that structure, it gives structure. And this is the first step towards ultrametricity, which was a, which was a, a great question and it's answered in the last paper, right? Now, the second big result was here by, by Francesco, Francesco, Francesco Guerra and Fabio Toninelli, uh, about the existence of the thermodynamic limit, the existence of the limit I wrote on the first slide. It's not clear that that limit exists, that F, the free energy as the limit exists. And not only they prove existence, they, they also prove that self-averaging about which I told you that it's a, it's a concentration of measure problem. And the third result is also from Francesco, Francesco Guerra, which proves that these are rigorous mathematical proofs. But, Paris's solution is actually a bound on the free energy. It's a lower bound on the free energy. It's not proving fully, but these three papers are brilliant ideas. They are real joy. Right? Then comes this book by, by Michel Talagram. I think you know the name of Michel Talagram because he's an absolutely famous person in concentration of measure. He wrote this 600 pages paper about test title, you see. So it tells you that even for mathematicians, it must be something. And the last word in the Paris's formula was in this paper by Michel Talagran, where uh, Paris for the other bound was put. But Talagran all the way acknowledges Francesco Guerra's uh, contribution. And the last paper I want to mention is this one of, of uh, Dmitry Panchenko, more recent one where he establishes the ultrametricity indeed of the limiting distribution. If I quote the main theorem from here, you will think that this is an absolute, it's pure mathematics. It's about some measures on the unit sphere of a Hilbert space and some properties there. So it's a very beautiful thing. You wouldn't think that it comes from, it comes from physics. Okay, so that much about spin glasses. That much about spin glasses. This was a bit more than 25 minutes, I guess. And now let's speak about domain growth. And the KPZ, Kadar Paris' Zandication. This is one single paper. The other one were about three or four papers of Paris and many more in many details. The basic uh, And what Paris, uh, what these people wanted to understand is uh, how front, how should I say, domain front, so boundary, you have some domain occupied by. By, by some some objects or some some entity which grows but random. And how do the how does the interface fluctuate? Is there some general? Of course, it depends on the. So always the idea is that details depend on the system you look at, but there must be some universal behavior which which is there for all systems. Right, so it's about, and here is an example which I recall I read in a paper already shared that I couldn't find the paper now when, when I was preparing this lecture. So I'm a bit confused now whether I recall correctly that, that one of the first paper was. So the following problem, anyway, the marching soldiers. Huh? The marching soldiers, is, the problem is the following. So imagine you have a line of soldiers who won't march forward, right? They can make one step forward. But, and they do it, try to do it independently. They have exponential clocks, and when the clock ring, independent exponential clock, then the guy tries to jump. But they cannot go too much behind, uh, ahead and cannot let, be left too much behind. So imagine they are tied with some, with some. And the question is, the question is, in the large scale, you imagine what the dynamics is. You can put it in proper mathematical terms. What is the large scale fluctuation? Of this? That's that's easy to understand. And uh, okay, so 
there are many more physical examples. And as you see, I quote again two papers of two friends of ours. One is uh, Zoltan Ratz, and the other one is Tomasz Wiczek. With family, these are very famous. Okay, the family Wiczek paper is I don't know how many thousand times cited in physics literature. And uh, at Pliska and Ratz also, uh, they actually came earlier, and these papers are quoted as, 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 as uh, inspiration for, for the Karl Paris Zang uh, development. And you will see some other examples, some other examples. Here is, a, here is a picture from the original paper. So this is what I told you. So this is, this front is marching forward. H by H is denoted, I also fixed some notation. H is the, imagine that the front make, goes forward so that you can imagine it as a, as a graph of a function. There are no overhangs and things like that, right? And uh, you easily imagine what that is. And I really encourage you to look to, to look for some videos for current KPZ videos. You will see some very very uh, spectacular things if you if you. If you follow. And what these people wrote down is the following partial differential stochastic partial differential equation. So h is a real number which depends on time, which is r plus, and on the spatial variable. I will concentrate on d equals one later. Uh, and this is the so this is the differential equation they write down. This is easy to understand. Namely, dH by dt, there is something like the heat equation or the diffusion equation in that. So that's a that's a Laplacian, right? There is a nonlinear term that means the square of the gradient. And this is the new, this is this this causes it, the difficulties and the interesting things. And there is some noise added, and the noise is the most straightforward noise. You can add its space time white noise, which does make sense. It's a bit of a singular object, but, but it makes proper mathematical sense. There are some constants there, but the constants could be safely chosen to be one, otherwise scale them out. So it's a it's a it's a tamely looking partial differential equation, but it's not that it's very difficult. And the most studied case is dimension equals which means not one dimensional object this means two dimensional object because h is the way you go forward so it's a two dimensional one dimensional boundary of a two dimensional volume okay and what they derived in their way physical way which is i propose that so i, I do it with with with, with honor. so it's not the, i don't when I say the physical way, it's ingenious and great, just the epsilons and deltas may be right? Is that this equation, as you see here, the solution in what some sense, if you find a solution of this equation, it has a, it must have a scaling limit. Now, for those of you who don't know much about what scaling limits are, think about the Brownian motion, think about random walk. So the first and the mother of all scaling limits is the central limit theorem. And, uh, and the invariance principle, namely that no matter what kind of random walk you have in say one dimension, just assume zero mean and finite variance in proper, under proper scaling, it will converge to Brownian motion, right? So that's the mother of all scaling limits. Now we want to understand something of this spirit, but for the solution of this stochastic partial differential equation. And what they propose is that they, it should scale as I, Put here, I said that there is no not all epsilons, and then I wrote an epsilon. I didn't mean this epsilon. I wrote, but I can. namely divide, denote by h tilde h minus its mean value. As the soldiers march forward, there is a drift. You have to subtract the drift. You have to subtract the expected value in order to see the fluctuation. So subtract the, the expected value, whatever it is. Subtract the expected value. And what they propose that the following scaling should fall, namely, take long time. So I, epsilon is the scaling of one over epsilon. So take a time of length one over epsilon, which is long, space of order epsilon to the minus two thirds, and divide or multiply by epsilon to the one third. And in this way, you should get a limit. This is uh, not a Proving it is hard. This is a guess. This is a guess. And it should have a limit and denoted it by this H star. But mind that this is absolutely, even the PD itself is singular. 
there is this singular object there, there is a non-linearity there, even giving sense to this tamely looking partial differential equation is, is not straightforward at all. It was worse of a, of a Fields medal, by the way, you will see. Uh, uh, so it's always, always a mystery here, in particular what the limiting object is, well, what kind of process is that process, depending on time and space, but terribly singular. So what I say is that if it's, it's different of anything what people had seen before in, in, in probability theory. And there was an early way of sort of in physical sense solving the problem. So they defined an other model which scaled in principle like this and solved in so-called beta ansatz. I just want to mention Deepak Dar and, and Herbert Schoen's name here, but I'm not going to speak about this at all. Now, why care about, again, why care, why is it difficult? First of all, care about it. So it's relevant because it's expected to hold in a very, very wide variety of universality. That's what we call universality. So it's expected to hold in a very wide variety of similar problems of very different phenomena as domain growth, as interacting fluctuations or of current in interacting particle system, what we call first passage or last passage percolation, random matrix spectral. Now I arrived somewhere where even mathematicians who are not very much in physics understand what I speak about and random permutations. And so it's a very, very, very uh, large variety of, of, of problems where this type of scaling and this type of limit is expected to be, right? And it's difficult for exactly the same reason, <laughs> or maybe not. Okay, it's difficult because even the stochastic PD is singular, as I said, is because there are absolutely no technical tools or no tools how to, how to speak about, about this non-conventional limits scalings and and the limiting object what you see here which i just wrote there if it exists it must be something unseen it's not like something like brownian motion or white noise or something we understand well nothing like that so who knows something strange what? okay and here is a surprise for you with no physics whatsoever a surprise for you there's this famous Ulam problem. So Sainz Abula was, of course, uh, I don't have to say much about this. But anyway, so one of his problems is the following. Sample uniform uh, permutation from, from the symmetric. Take the symmetric group on n objects, Sn, and sample uniform permutation. And let L sub n be the length of the longest increasing subsequence in this random permutation. It's clear what I mean, I don't have to explain. There might be more than one, but the length is one. The, long, the length of the longest increasing subset. And what Ulam asked, it was not very clear if you go back that what exactly he asked, but anything, what is, what is the asymptotics of this L sub? It's a random variable, tell me anything you know about in the limit when n goes to one, right? And if you want to read a very, very good survey with lots of examples from card games and all that up to 1999, read this paper by all these diagrams. And here you see, if you want to just write, draw the picture to sample a random permutation, do the following. Take a unit box, a unit, uh, unit square in, in the plane and drop n uniformly distributed independent points on it. And that realizes a random permutation because you have the first from left will be the, I don't know how, which one from down. And this is a uniform. And this red line you see here, which I drew here, is exactly one of the realizations of the longest increasing subset. There are many more. And as the size increases, there are fewer and fewer compared with the size of the system. And the meaningful questions are, what is the expected value? What is the so-called longitudinal fluctuation? So subtract the expected value. For some reason, I call it longitudinal subtraction because it's about fluctuation in this order, in this direction. And what is the transversal fluctuation? I wrote down a formula that I don't want to explain you the formula. Transversal fluctuation, you will imagine what that formula means without me writing. Right? Is it clear what I wrote? So you have a fluctuation along the increase and you have a fluctuation across transversal to the increase. And these, these are formally well-defined 
I don't tell you the last one, I leave it for a homework to, 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 to guess what J means there, but it's easy. But anyway, the picture tells you, the picture tells you what I mean. And here are the results, the mathematical results. The mathematical result, the first one was, was this uh, back in the 70s yet of uh, Logan and Shep and Vershka and Karov essentially independently, but in the end it was finished by Vershka and Karov. They proved that this expected length divided by square root of n converges to two, which is, you say, okay, two is a trivial number, probably it's easy. No, it's a difficult problem. It's a very difficult problem. And it took these people who are, of course, you know who they are, to, to prove it, right? So this was a big reason. And the next one, was uh, Kurt Johansson, uh, Bike, Dave, and Johansson in 1999, where they proved this, this was absolute breakthrough at the time. Say, namely, subtract from L, L sub n its expected value, or asymptotic expected value, known by n to the one six. And this guy will have a limiting distribution. And the limiting distribution has a name, is the Tracy Vidom distribution, that's how it's called today, or one of the Tracy Vidom distribution. And there is some formula with some expression involving airy functions, and so it's complicated, but nevertheless, it's there. This is absolute surprise. Again, those of you who are trained with limit theorems of probability will not recognize any one of these exponents. Or the one half you recognize, but it's not that one half. And then came another paper of Kurt Johansson only, where he spoke about the transversal fluctuations, scaling, this is scaled like n to the minus one six, the other guy scaled like n to the minus one third, right? And there is another limiting distribution. These are complicated to write down, not one of these functions. And what I want to point out that know that this is exactly the case, Kandar Paris is scaling, because n to the one half is a natural time unit. If I go back, along, along the line, you see n to the one half square root of n points. So that's the natural number of order, right? And, and, and that means that the, that the longitudinal fluctuation, this one, will be one third power of the time scale and the transversal fluctuation will be two thirds power, which is exactly what you have seen before. And it's not, a, not by chance, it's for good reasons. And you can embed it in a bigger problem and it's for good reasons, right? And some more results, mathematical results here. It are, this is a hot topic now in, in probability theory and partial differential equations. So uh, it's, I, it's difficult to, to quote fairly, but I, I don't think I made big mistake when quoting only three here. Namely, Martin Heider's regularity structures theory for stochastic partial differential equations, which for which Martin Heider got the, 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 the Fields Medal in 20, certainly mostly for this, right? The first paper of the, the in the series, this is the title of the first paper, co, uh, solving the KPZ equation. It's nothing to explain, no? So just solving, it's not about the scaling limit. It's about giving sense to that uh, very singular partial differential. Right. Now what the scaling limit is, that's, a, that's another mystery. And there are two recent works, one by, uh, by Jeremy Quastel and Daniel Remedic and Matetska, I don't know. Anyway, where they, they sort of identify or characterize in an analytic way. By analytic way, I mean, I tell you what the difficulty here is. I will tell you a few words about this. Sort of analytic characterization, probably you forgot what this H star is. H star is the presumed limiting object, which is a process, a singular process, a distribution value, stochastic process, a very difficult object. Right? So there is a partial, not a total characterization, partial analytic characterization here. And a more recent work by Bali Twirag and, and, uh, and uh, Duncan, Duncan Dovern and his, some of other many papers with various co-authors. And Bali spoke about this in this seminar, about this in this seminar some weeks, no, maybe some months ago, uh, which gives some alternative 
stochastic geometric characterization of the limited energy. So we are towards understanding. But these are big things, right? And I have no idea where I am in time. Any time is about to finish. Well, then I skip the last one. I'm happy to tell you about the last the third anytime if you wish, because this was so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much for the very dense talk filled with physical life, physics ideas and mathematics. Any questions? Uh, yeah, so I will bring the mic so even the Zoom crowd will hear you. So I'd like to ask about the robustness of the KPZ class. So, so if you take this uh, marching soldiers model. Yes. And they have to also observe a social distancing of one meter. Does it still describe by the KPC? It's distancing They cannot go further. That's right. That's one condition. And the other is that they have a social distancing of one meter. Between them, horizontally. Yeah, so, so there's an upper bound square root ah, of so two and the lower bound one. Yes, does, does it still describe by the KPC oh, equation? Okay. Uh, yes, so, so this, these are, but I... It, so the question is the following, that if I change the rules in the marching soldiers, so I say that, because I said that they, they cannot be further away from each other than square root of two, I said. But now the question is, okay, that give also lower bound that they, are, they cannot go closer than square root of two over two. That's your question? Yeah, that's for coronary reasons, right? For, for coronary, coronary reasons, reasons, yes. Whether the universality so belongs to the same, I would guess, but this is guess. Yes, so this is a very robust. Yes, robustness, as you have some physics background, I guess. Uh, robust, no. So robustness, the, what we call universality, means that microscopic details don't matter. So there are some global, some behave, there are some behavior, say robust behavior, which is reflected in the scaling limit. In the scaling limit, you don't see the details. As in the central limit theorem, which I call the mother of all scaling limits, you don't see the details of your rent, of, of the distributions of the, of the individual random variables you add up. You only see the same behavior. So I think the question, the answer to your question should be, but take it to the grain of salt because this is, it's, it's cheap to say yes. Okay, thank you. And for some, there are cases when it's sort of proved, but few cases. So there is this emerging new, new branch of probability which is called integrable probability. So with application of various algebraic representation theory and so on, and various computations and so on. So computable things where they get results. But the big question remains the universality, how robust it is. So is it the case that if I just change it a little locally, the big picture remains unchanged? And probably, yeah, so that's what we learned in physics that this must be the case, but these are very difficult things to study. There's another question from here. Okay, so this is sort of a stupid question, but why do you, uh... Why, why is the KPC, why is the, the gradient squared? Like, why is not like- Oh, that's, that's from explanation? the derivation. So if you look at the, at the physics space, so they keep, they do some power expansion and some reasonable argumentation, and they just keep the first, the leading order term. They keep a leading order term and that's the leading order term. If you, if you raise, if you, just the opposite question, uh, okay, I don't, just it's related to your question. Let me go back. If you say, don't keep the, just keep the linear terms, then you arrive to something which is explicitly solvable. It's, it's, it's a linear equation, uh, infinite dimensional or shine Ullenbeck process, Ullenbeck process mm -hmm. will be the solution, which is not a trivial thing at all. It's absolutely not a trivial thing, but you can handle it. And the nonlinear, this is the first nonlinear term which, which makes it changes. And it changes not only in the sense that one is solvable explicitly, the other one is not, but the scaling is changed. Because if you, if you take zero, if you take for lambda equals zero, that's a different universal. That scales in a totally different way. You can, I leave it for you as a homework to find out how it scales because it's computable. It's a Gaussian process. 
because it's linear and it's driven by a Gaussian. It's, it's a Gaussian process, explicitly computable. Thank you. Thank you. I just would like to mention that it doesn't seem uh, to have any relation to combat risk, but it has. Uh, uh, let me formulate it in the language of director and two big uh, offices. Then actually, this is the famous max cut problem in, in, in case of grass. You would like to find the maximum number of edges between the two classes. Poor director, this problem is NP hard, so you have no hope to solve. That's the easing. This. So the ferromagnetic easing problem combinatorially yeah. is yeah, exactly yeah. what you said. That's I, but, yeah, yeah. I just but that's with the same J's. That's not yeah, with yeah. the random J's. This is the that's the version. ferromagnetic. The ferromagnetic yeah, yeah. combinatorial in our visual glass is exactly exactly. Even just that case is sorry. And even just that case is NP hard, so this is extremely complicated. But yeah, it depends on what you ask. So uh, it's NP hard if you want to ask to very sorry. Maximize. This is the question. You know, uh, do you want it in, a, in an in an arbitrary on an arbitrary graph? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if you don't have structure on the graph, then of course. Any other questions? I have some historic question. Namely, uh, I read Mondor's paper in physical assembly. I hope you. <laughs> you, you <laughs> sorry. I, I read Condor paper and he writes that the baby version of the replica method can be found in, in, in hardly little Koya inequalities. Do you I, or anyone I, know? I tell you, when I read it, I was in Bristol it was last yeah. week, and I have hardly a little bit of Koya on my shelf here in Budapest. So I, in Bristol, I didn't have it with me, so I couldn't check. I want to check where, what, what, what it, I think it is around here. Is if it, okay, it's, it's a question about Imre Condor's paper. Yeah. Was he in the audience? Yeah, he told me that. Anyway. Uh, okay. Yeah, so it, I, I have to check. Yeah, that's very interesting. That, that, the question because I saw that perhaps someone else from the audience but uh, but that's about the, so that's meant what okay let me let me reformulate what Domokos says so that that in this paper of Imre Kondor I mentioned at the beginning it's mentioned that actually this replica symmetry not the replica symmetry but or computing the logarithm of some expectation as you have for the integers the powers the the, the moments and extend it to to reals and do the tricks and get r to zero, then you have that this sort of argumentation is there in Poya, in uh, Hardy Little Good and Poya inequalities. There is this famous book, inequalities. And indeed, it's written there. And I, I, I myself, I want to check where, but I, I can't tell you. <clears throat> Sorry, may I make a remark? Sorry? May I make a remark? I sure. am in the yeah, I was going to ask you exactly where, where, where this is in, 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 in Poya and Ansel. Sure. Well, I don't remember the page number, but it's definitely in the inequalities. In the inequalities, yeah. Yeah. I looked it up once. Ah, so you, you, you found it there? Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. Okay, great. So we have to we have to look at what. what, what yeah, but <clears throat> in contrast to the physicist, they are specifying the conditions under which uh, the analytic continuation in N is uh, meaningful and yeah. unique. Great, thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> If not, that first let me assure everybody that we don't have a thousand participants at the Institute. We don't have so hard feelings and we are buying apartments. So even if something happens, <laughs> we'll, we can handle the situation. <laughs> and so if there are no other questions, then we should thank uh, Balint for this very entertaining. <laughs>